He's also a father. Um, big difference between the two lungs of the church is that we have married priests. Um, and he can explain a little bit of how that's possible. Um, he'll be talking about his kind of discernment process, um, having actual kids, and then a bunch of spiritual kids. So, uh, Dad, please come on up. So, I've got my earthly son and a number of spiritual sons <laughs> here today. Um, I think I'll probably sit. <laughs> Alright, so who? Shout out. Shout out to John Schubert. John Schubert! You got another one. Woo! church was in the process of Latinization. There were no icons, icons were removed, statues were put in uh, into the churches. Um, I grew up with Stations of the Cross during Lent, or what we know as the Great Fast. But I also grew up with a remnant of our tradition. I had a married pastor who had three adult children, uh, one of whom was friends with my dad, and who also had grandchildren. So that's what I grew up with. It was very normal for me having a married priest. So there were very few married visiting Catholic priests at that time. We go back in history when um, the people when Byzantine Catholics came in from the Austrian-Hungary Empire, largely, uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, the church said that there should be no married priest serving the Byzantine Catholics in the United States. And because there were so few priests, priest shortage is, is nothing new in many ways. Uh, because there were so few priests, there were married priests served, coming in from Europe to serve our people. And Father Alexis Toz came in, I think, from the Eparchy of Presho in, in, in what is now Slovakia. And uh, he went to serve a group, uh, a, a parish community in Minnesota, Minneapolis. And uh, he went to speak with Bishop, Archbishop John Ireland, and um, Father Ireland did not speak Slovak or Hungarian, and, and, and uh, Father Toth did not speak uh, English, so they spoke in Latin. They spoke in Latin. And it became apparent after a while that Father chose, well, well, technically not married, he was a widower, and all hell broke loose. Father, I mean, Bishop Ireland lost his temper, and, and Father Toth lost his temper. And that led to Father Toth taking a congregation of people and other priests, leading other priests, into the Russian Orthodox Church. So at that time, that was about 1890, we lost about 150,000 Byzantine Catholics. And then fast forward to 1929, the, the church in, in Rome wanted to uh, make a stronger statement prohibiting married men from being priests in the United States and Canada. And that led to another group 
leaving our church. So all told, we lost about a quarter of a million Byzantine Catholics, um, largely in relation to, to the celibacy issue. Well, fast forward to the Second Vatican Council. And I'm growing up as a happy Byzantine Catholic kid, then teenager, uh, discerning marriage, knowing that, my, but also being attracted to uh, the ministry. But you know, I went to college thinking I'd be a forest ranger or a, uh, or a wildlife biologist, ended up a psychologist. So you see how it's, life can take its twists and turns. And um, as I was discerning marriage to my wife, one of the things I told her was that, you know, I, I think I would discern, I will discern the diaconate eventually uh, after we've been married for a while. And um, what, this is after the Second Vatican Council, well after the Second Vatican Council. And one of the things that the Second Vatican Council did was write a, a uh, document, the decree on the Catholic Church of the Eastern Rite. And basically, it not only encouraged us, but it it told us that we need to restore our, our traditions and, and that our traditions are valid traditions. And, and, and St. John Paul II wrote um, The Light of the East, Orientale Lumen, and, and, and he talked about the church breathing with two lungs, Eastern and Western. And St. John Paul II opened up the door to the married priesthood in North America. Remember, their married men were being ordained to the priesthood in, in Europe all along. And uh, he said that, you know, if a bishop in the United States or Canada wanted to ordain a married man to the priesthood, they could petition Rome. So that's how it was from the late 1990s. In the meantime, Caroline, my wife, and I, after having our daughter, and her son Paul, and he was multiply handicapped with a life-shortening illness. He, he died at the age of eight. And I said to Carolyn at that time, you know, my diaconate is with Paul, caring for our multi, multiply handicapped son. That was my diaconate, that was my service. Well, Paul passed in 04, John came along in 05, right? He was adopted from Guatemala, and by 2010, I was discerning the diaconate in the Byzantine Catholic Church. Fine. Uh, everything proceeded smoothly. Caroline was very supportive of me. I didn't get John's or Adriana's support. They were too young to be given support uh, in any formal way. Uh, so I went off to Pittsburgh for two, for four summers, two weeks each summer for intensive learning. That was 2011 to 2014. In June of 2014, Pope Francis opened up the door to the married priesthood a bit more widely. The bishops in the United States and Canada would no longer need to uh, petition Rome, the Vatican, for permission to ordain married men to the priesthood. It was up to them. So I was in my last year of formation to the diaconate. Of course, I'm not thinking about priesthood. I'm thinking about becoming a deacon. That's what I was in formation for uh, now in my fourth year. In 2015, I was ordained to the diaconate. Um, and shortly after that, I learned um, and all my brother deacons learned that any man who had gone through our formation process at our seminary in Pittsburgh would need, to, if they felt called to the priesthood, would need to return to Pittsburgh for two years of full-time studies. 
So I never entertained this possibility because I'm not going to uh, uproot my family to go to Pittsburgh for two years and then come back, come back east. Um, it would be too disruptive. Didn't even bring it up. Well, fast forward to August, early August of 21. Uh, Bishop Kurt was at St. Thomas the Apostle, which is our home parish. Uh, and he was celebra celebrating the Divine Liturgy. I was the concelebrating deacon. And at the end of the liturgy, he says, Tom, this Texas drawl. He says, Tom, I, I think I got an inspiration from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Did you hear anything? I said, no. He says, well, pray about it. Give it some thought. And then a few weeks passed. And uh, I mean, at one, one level, I thought, well, maybe he's thinking priesthood, but I can't go to Pittsburgh. <laughs> and it turned out that that's what his inspiration was, that I should become, I should be ordained to the priesthood and serve our embarky as a priest. And I needed to talk with him about this. And, and my pastor, Father Jim, shared that with me. You know, I, I think he wants to talk about the priesthood. And uh, I think I was by myself at that particular liturgy, so I called Caroline up on the way home. And I shared this with him. I said, I, I can't go to Pittsburgh for two years. I'm not going to uproot us. And Caroline says, you cannot not talk to Bishop Kurt. Which is to say, you must have talked to Bishop Kurt. So in September, we had our deacon's retreat on Long Island. And Bishop Kurt was out in Ukraine, flew back to uh, JFK, and our retreat was out uh, on the island in Huntington. No, I guess it was Huntington. And uh, it was arranged that I would drive him back to Jersey, which is where he lives, Emperor Pia Pesek. Um, and he said to me, well, I said, no, I, I, can't, I can't go to Pittsburgh. He says, well, I will exempt you from going to Pittsburgh for two years. He says, you've been forming men in the seminary for 17 years. That's got to count for something. <laughs> Bring it home, talk to Caroline, talk to John, talk to Adriana, and uh, prayed a bit, more than a bit, talk to my spiritual father, talk to my pastor, and um, I will do it. You know, this, this is of God. Everybody, that seems to be the consensus. And, uh, you know, when, when you're a married man, said to be ordained either to the diaconate or to the priesthood, at least in our church, uh, the wife must give permission. Everything rested with Caroline. And she had to sign her name in quadruplicate. There are four copies of her statement saying that she fully supports my being ordained to the priesthood. So, December 18th, 2021, all the guys at uh, St. Andrews were there. My family was there. Some of you guys served. I, I know Conrad served because he was an upper classman. Anybody else served here? So, what has my time been like as a priest? First of all, there were a lot more demands on my time than there were as a deacon. I could easily say as a deacon, I'm not available. Uh, I could say that to my pastor for particular liturgical celebrations. But at this point in time, well, when I was first ordained, I was to be uh, 
basically a supply priest, a fill-in priest, based out of St. Thomas the Apostle in Norway, mostly serving there on weekends. Uh, but one priest um, went on leave and um, is no longer serving in the FRP, and I replaced him. So I now have two small parishes, one in Linden, St. George, and St. Nicholas in Donnellan. church in Denellen had uh, it was a Sunday Holy Day of Obligation parish only and I'm reintroducing a lot to that parish um, simple and solemn Holy Days uh, services during Lent during the week uh, and it, it's, it's been a for me it's been a very wonderful experience hearing confessions, celebrating the, the Eucharist, consecrating the, the gifts of bread and wine. I've also found that in comparison to my six years, almost six years as a deacon, uh, people are much more likely to, to approach me, to talk about things that are going on in their lives. Uh, I've had the even though I have a couple of very small parishes, I've, I've already had a wedding at one of them, but I also married, officiated at the wedding of my daughter uh, and son-in-law just a few months ago, and uh, I'm going to do my second, is it my second? Baptism, chrismation, and first Eucharist when my granddaughter is born. Uh, and that'll be in September. We already have the date set. So it's it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, I hope it's been for my family too. Uh, I'll take questions now. You've got my story. Any questions? Yeah, Justin, and then Joe. Uh, what is the Well, you know what? That's a good question. I, I think knowing how children become adolescents, become adults, move on into, solidly into adulthood, you know, there are de developmental stages. And I think that helps has helped me to uh, be attuned to the developmental stages of the people in my parish not only psychologically, but also spiritually. That, that's, that's one thing. And that reminds me of, of something else. Uh, Father Chris Zuger, who I've known for years, is now in, in Albuquerque. He was going through the history of our church at our assembly back in November. And uh, he said, you know, we've always been in the, a, a mission church, an evangelizing church. It, there were like 400 conversions, and he's not talking about transfers of rights. Early on in our history, 400 conversions in a short period of time when our people were coming to the United States, and you know many of them were Protestants, like Calvinists. And one of the things, according to what he had read, that people found attractive, the Calvinists found attractive, is well, they've got married priests, so they'll understand us. Um, so that, that, that's the answer to that question. Joe, you had a question? Yeah, I, uh, kind of two separate ones. First is, you know, what type of formation did you have to do since you were exempted through most of it? I'm sure there was some, at least liturgical formation between the diaconate and the, and the presbyteral. And then, you know, what has the reception been from, you know, Latin rite, uh, priests or even, you know, parishioners to, you know, something that's very different when it comes to, when it comes to celibacy and, and married life. Okay, well, the reception by Latin Rite priests and lay people, but well, let me back up and say, 
reception from Byzantine Catholics is extremely positive. At this point in time, roughly half of our presbytery is married. Most of those men have, are young and have come from Slovakia and Western Ukraine. This is where most of those men are from. And they'll come and they'll bring their little kids. Uh, most of them have young kids, although uh, Mikhailos on Stepan is your age, he's 20. But they've been here, they were one of the first priests to come over. And, and it's, it's very positive. We had some, uh, uh, one of our newest priests coming over from uh, Ukraine was staying at the rectory in Linden for maybe three months as he was getting acclimated to the area. Uh, and now he's been transferred to his first assignment in, in North Fort Myers, Florida. And he has two little girls. You know, his, he's all of, I think he's all of 29. His wife is 25. And they have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And, you know, everybody dotes on the kids. And, 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 and another priest's wife was helping make Easter Paschas and the Arthos bread, which we have uh, for, for, for Thomas Sunday, the week after Easter. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's very positive. And remember, many of the, the old people in their 70s and 80s knew a good number of married priests way back. Uh, but again, there are so many young ones right now. And, and in some of the small, older parishes, it's an injection of young life into the parish. So it's very positive. Uh, in terms of Latin Rite, Roman Rite Catholics, uh, priests, I, I've only had positive experiences with them. As a matter of fact, I was helping out with confessions at our parish in Hillsborough last Thursday evening, and, and there was a Roman uh, right priest, pastor of a parish down in the Touch and Diocese, and, and he's good friends with, with yeah, the Touch and Diocese, Father Edmund. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know his last name offhand. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's very friendly. I'm, I'm new as a priest, but another one of the married priests, he, he's, he's very friendly with me, you know, for quite a while. Um, so it's, it's, there, there hasn't been anything negative. Um, you know, Cardinal Tobin knows who I am and, and he's been supportive of me. Um, so, yeah, it, it's different from the 1890s and early 1900s. Very different. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask, it, it's a two part question. One, the first part is how do you manage balancing between marriage like you see like and do you find that difficult to balance that? Well Caroline, John, Adriana, and my son-in-law Rich worship at St. Thomas the Apostle. Sometimes Caroline will join me at one of the two parishes like on a weeknight for a service. Uh, so that I miss. I'm not worshiping with my family. However, I can fiddle with schedules. So like uh, on Holy Saturday, I'll have the, I'm going to have the Easter vigil and Good Friday too, like an hour earlier than they do at Broadway at St. Thomas. So by the time I'm finished, I can scoot over to Broadway and say, spend some time with my family and say hi to the people that I've been worshiping with for, you know, more than 30 years. Um, you know, sometimes I have to do what I have to do. I have to go to a hospital to uh, administer the sacraments to somebody who's dying. I mean, but again, small parishes. I don't have a parish. I have two parishes. Well, that seems like a lot. But, you know, I might get anywhere from 30 to 40 people at the liturgy. Twenty-five families up at the smaller of the two parishes. Now, a parish like that, the Roman Church would probably be shut down, right? You know, so so we 
we are much smaller in number. So if you think about it, I basically have a large extended family, and I can manage it. I can manage it. You know, unfortunately, my, my so-called day job here at, at St. Andrew's Seminary, um, yeah, you like that, day job. <laughs> uh, it, it, if, if I'm summoned by the bishop for a meeting, you know, Father Peter's very forgiving. You don't, you don't mess with the bishop, right? Does that answer it? No. Okay. Anybody else? Father. Yes, Father Colin. Father, thank you. You want to hear something ridiculous? Always. Do you know married men, but mostly married women, come to me to talk about their marriages and their family. And as a close, one of the, maybe the closest friend of mine, herself, wife and mother, says to me in the most loving way possible, why, forgive me guys, why the blank are they coming to you to talk about marriage? Now, my question, should I take a pack of your business cards and the next time a husband or wife, a mother or father come to me to talk about their marriage, I said, talk to Father Tom. Comments. Uh, no, because number one, I don't have the time. <laughs> Secondly, you know, I, I said before that as a priest, people are more likely to come to me with things. And I don't think it's because I'm a married man, because I was a deacon. I think it has to do with the, the sacrament of reconciliation and the seal of confession. And I think that, um, so, so that's part of the answer. But the other thing, too, is I do believe that a celibate priest is able to counsel people who are married, about their marriages. As a matter of fact, I was unmarried when I first started in, in, in my practice providing marital counseling to couples. And um, I had only heard about one person who questioned my ability to do that. And um, he was a, a buddy of mine from, from high school way back when. Uh, so I don't think I have a lock on, uh, on the market for providing marital counseling for couples who, who want somebody who is Catholic. I think I've answered it, right? Yeah. Probably not to the satisfaction of my friend, but yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Ted. Probably so. <clears throat> I want to put you back in the of the Adrian discussion a little bit, just about kind of the aspect of having you know family, but then also like your spiritual family. Just like in in your experience there, what has it been like? Because um, just from what I've heard with. Uh, just hearing like the stories like from priests and, and religious, it's very much it's a giving of yourself and it's a laying down of like your life for like the person in front of you and I'm curious what's that, what that is like what that is like with like having a family, having a wife son and a daughter, then also having people who aren't related to you by blood but like still in like laying down your life for that person, less, less from like the schedule and like practical side of like I can, you know, like move schedules around and more like what what that's like for you on like a personal level. Does that make sense? I think it does. Okay. Um, what I have found since my ordination to the priesthood is or has been a growing 
concern for my parish family? You know, what is it that the people need? How can I shepherd them? Um, and I, I think, you know, my wife is is very understanding with regard to, okay, I need to stay late tonight for whatever. Or, or I'm going to do a, a, a sick call. You know, you do what you need to do. And I've never gotten any flag from John or, or Adriana on that either. Um, the, the other piece of that too is, and I think it relates to the fact that we are, in, in our church, there, there had been this, this history of having married priests. You know, people are very understanding too. Okay? If I'm going to change the time of the service because of, you know, something, well, my daughter was married and she wanted to be married on a Sunday and uh, I took the weekend off and I had to miss the uh, annual Oktoberfest at one of the parishes I served, okay? And uh, they were fine with that. They were fine with that. But I was able to get them a, a substitute priest for that weekend who would be able to join them for their October fast after the liturgy. And I rescheduled the liturgy. Well, I, didn't, I don't need to get into that detail, but uh, I did some shuffling at both parishes as well as finding a substitute. Um, so I, I, I find it, that I have a strong connection to the people at, at, at both my parishes. Um, and, and, you know, I. I, I love them, I pray for them, and I try to do things that I believe that would be helpful to their own, their own journeys in, in, in faith. And I likewise try to do the same thing for, for my family. Uh, would I be able to do it if I had a parish of five or six hundred families or more? That would be much, much more challenging. Yeah, Jacob, and then Michael. Uh, so, Father, forgive me, because I forget what it was, what it, what it was the name of it, but uh, our, my, our first year, we had a prayer service at, um, at your parish. It was, I forget, it was like a party. Um, it was like a prayer service for expecting mothers. Oh, our Lady Help of Mothers, yes. Yeah. It, what other kinds of devotion or, or services you know, do, you, do you have in your your life or your parish. Okay, well, let, let's talk about the great fast. Let's talk about Lent. Uh, in the Byzantine church, weekdays are a liturgical. There are no divine liturgies. Our word for mass, or our term for mass. Not during the week. But the people need the Eucharist for spiritual nourishment. So on Wednesdays and Fridays, we have the liturgy of St. Gregory, the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts. I consecrate bread into the body of Christ on the Sunday before that liturgy during, during the great fast. And I reserve it in the tabernacle. And then when I have the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, it's basically a Vesper service, very penitentially flavored Vesper service with communion. And at most parishes, it's Wednesday and Fridays if they have a, a resident priest, or if you have somebody like me who's got to split my time between the two parishes. I have Wednesday evening at one parish and Friday evening at another parish. Uh, I grew up, and 
It's a wonderful service. I, I grew up with the Stations of the Cross, but that was a Latinization from the 1950s that kept going into the early to mid 70s. And then again, following the Vatican II, restore your traditions. All right. Uh, there's the Akathist hymn. Well, there is a number of different Akathist hymns. These are services either to, primarily to the Mother of God, to the Theotokos, or to Jesus, lover of mankind. And we don't have the devotion of the rosary in the Byzantine year. That, actually, that's seen as a Latinization. Uh, my wife and I will pray the rosary together. You know, mo mo most nights. Uh, tonight might be an exception. Uh, so we have the Akathist hymns. We have this. Three different liturgies. Well, I told you about the liturgy of St. Gregory, the liturgy of sanctified gifts. The liturgy that is celebrated on most Sundays is the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, who was up here in this game. During the Great Fast, every Sunday during the Great Fast, we celebrate the liturgy of St. Basil the Great. And it is very similar to the uh, liturgy of John Chrysostom. However, the uh, anaphora, the Eucharistic prayer, is, is about four times longer than the anaphora of Saint, uh, Saint John Chrysostom. And uh, that's taxing when you've got to go to another parish right after your first liturgy. I feel like a man of leisure by the time I get to Linden, late, late Sunday morning. Um, another practice that we have is the, that the infants receive all three sacraments of initiation together. So when my granddaughter comes in, on September 8th, we've got a plan already, so I have substitution, uh, I will, baptize her. I will chrismate her, which is our term for confirm. And I will give her first her first Eucharist, all in one divine liturgy. Now, when I was born, and I was chrismated in 55, I was born, I, I was baptized and chrismated. I received First Holy Communion like all my Roman Catholic friends. Uh, when Adriana was born, likewise, that was 94, she was baptized and chrismated. And when my late son Paul was born, Two years later, he received baptism, chrismation, and Holy Eucharist. Okay, so you can see, 1995 into 96, we were still restoring our traditions. Um, and it wasn't until the mid-90s that, that, that the first Eucharist came back. And you know, some people, had a hard time, had difficulties with this chain. You know, I you know, wanted my daughter to have her nice white dress. And, uh, but you know, in, in some parishes, what they try to do is have, is, is to make a big deal, and I think rightfully so, about first reconciliation. And a young child, well, obviously a baby is going to be carried up in his mom's or, or, or dad's arms to receive the first the, the Eucharist on a week-to-week -week basis. It uh, basically will go up for communion in front of, with their, with their parent uh, when they're very young. Then when they, after they've made their uh, first reconciliation, then they'll go up on their own to receive communion. Michael, yeah, you've got a question. In the parish where your shepherd 